Well, good morning again. Thank you again so much for being here. We have been in a series called The Church, The Hope of the World. And so it's this church that, or this, this series that has been about these New Testament metaphors that teach us what the church is and what it is here to do, what it is called to do. And so when we look at this, we, we have to understand that the, like the church, the hope of the world, this is who we are supposed to be, is to be some form of hope. And so the, the analogy we're going to go over this morning, the metaphor is called the family of God. And I actually want to start by looking at one of Jesus' most interesting phrases that he said uh, during his time here on earth. Let's, let's look at it. It's going to be on the screen for you. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and, and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Very interesting that what Jesus does here is he he makes this comparison. He basically says, he kind of disregards his own like earthly family and then says, if you are, if you do the will of God, then you are part of my family. You are my mother, you are my brother, you are my sister, and we are all under the father. And what's really important for us to understand is that this is like, to be part of the family of God means to do the will of God, to follow in a way that we would say about our lives, my life is meant to do the will of God. And there are several different ways that we can do this in terms of being, doing the will of God as a church. First of all, is that our main goal, and this is what our mission is as a church, is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you remember that, it's to make disciples of all nations. That's actually from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 20, at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, this, this is final command to them, make disciples of all nations. And it's more than just what we often do is we think about like making this word, this, making converts, basically people who like get like say they believe in Jesus and then that then we track that number and we say okay we have had 30 people this year say that they're going to be a follower of Christ but our goal is actually that people would say I am a follower of Jesus Christ I don't just believe in him but I'm going to live my life in a way that uh, walks in the footsteps of Jesus himself so that's our first thing. Second thing is that we would love one another. And we'll talk more about this in detail. And we've talked about this also in this series. But that we would love one another as the church. Because that's what families do. We love each other. Now, even when things get crazy, even things get, even things get stressful, we still love one another. Even if there are mistakes made, even if there are things where we hurt other people, we still love one another. And then as well, that we would help each other become mature followers of Christ, that we would lift each other up. We talked about this when it came to what we call the body of Christ, that part of being the body of Christ is meaning to build each other up, to encourage each other so that we can know Jesus more and more. So this is really cool thing that happens. It's supposed to, we're supposed to help each other grow in, in Christ. And then lastly, to be a hope for a world that is truly right now, especially desperately in need of hope. With all the, the tension that we see in our world right now, and especially in our culture, man, is it important right now for us to, to be the hope for the world, to say, you know what, we are going to be a place, a beacon of hope, because right now our world is seemingly like falling apart to a lot of us. Like we see what's happening in North, what's going on with the North Korea situation, and that creates a lot of stress, but we see that this world is desperately in hope, right, in desperately need of hope right now because there's a lot of fear surrounding that. But then we also look at situations like what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia yesterday, and if you're not aware of that, look it up. It's a horrible situation. We look at that and we see all of the things surrounding that, and we say, Lord Jesus, just come. This is getting really hard. But if there's a time for us right now as a church to recognize that we need to be the family of God so that when people come into our midst, that they would see something completely different than what they see out in the rest of the world, it is right now. Things necessarily aren't any worse, I would say, than the rest of history because we live in a really sinful and broken world and things have been really bad for a long time. But now we're seeing it more and more on kind of a global scale. And so the reality is, is this is where we need to be. We need to be a family. Now for many people, 
And because I know the demographics of our society, there's going to be people in this room that are along, you know, varying degrees along this spectrum where the word family is going to create different responses. The main two responses are going to be one where it's this really positive thing where you think about your family life and I think about my family life. It's very positive. I was raised in a really great uh, Christian home where my parents loved me. They encouraged me. Uh, they weren't perfect and that's okay, but they lo- and so I think of the word family, and that's a beautiful thing, creates a lot of loyalty. You know, I'm a Quinn, so I'm loyal to my family. This is what we do. And then, but on the other side, there could be a lot of people where that word family brings up a lot of hurt and a lot of pain, a lot of brokenness because of what they have experienced. And so again, this is another reason why we need to be the place of hope for the world to say, this is what it's going to be. But in order for us to do that, In order for us to live in this way, we need to understand what it means for us to do, what we need to do as a church to live in this way so that we can be the family of God. And so what we're going to look at this morning, what does a family look like? What does the family of God look like? How does it operate? So we're going to look at four characteristics that kind of define what it means to be the family of God. And so I invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 3. If you need to use a Bible, if you don't have one of your own, there are brown hardcover back Bibles in the seat in front of you that you can pull out. It's on page 1229. And so we would love for you to turn there and join us but let me kind of give some background here really quick because we did a a series a while back on first john that pastor ron did and what this book really is about is the apostle john writing to kind of try and stop some people from these false teachers that were trying to teach and confuse and dissuade people from listening to what the apostles were saying about jesus they were trying to uh manipulate people and trying to change the way that they looked at Jesus. And so what John does is he creates these tests basically that help you go, okay, this is how you know who a real Christian is and this is how you know who is not a real Christian. And he's doing that to be very, I mean, it's very black and white kind of reading, but again, it's a test. And so that when people who are true followers of Christ would look at that and they would say, you know what? Yeah, I get, I'm, you're right, I need to live this better, I need to do this better, I'm going to try, I'm going to seek to live this way. But then when people who aren't real Christians would look at it and go, I think he's being too harsh, I think it's too, it's too black and white, he's not being right, I don't, I don't agree with him, I don't like what he has to say, you know, but I can, I can still have these other ways that I can live because, I, you know, because I, that's, God is okay with it, and that's not how this works. So that's what we we come to when we come to 1 John. So let's start verses uh, 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So what happens here in this part of the, of the letter is that John kind of like explodes with emotion here. He explodes into this feeling of like, look at what, how great this love that God has given to us, like oh, in overabundance, that word lavish, that overabundance to us that he has just given to us that, and look at that, we should be called children of God. Because here's the thing. As Christians, we know, we believe this idea that we, if we put our faith in Christ, that we are forgiven of our sins, and that is a great and beautiful thing. But not only that, by putting our faith in Christ, we become part of God's family. We become one of his children in a special relationship with him, part of his chosen people. We talked about this early in the series, about being a chosen people, a royal priesthood, that God has has chosen us to be in his family. And so John kind of explodes into this idea because being a child of God is this amazing, beautiful privilege that he has given to us that we don't deserve. It only takes a few seconds for us to take personal inventory to go, you know, yeah, I've got some sin in my life. I've got some problems. I've got some issues that I don't like about myself. I've got some things that I do that I'm not proud of. There are, there are things in my past that I'm not proud of, but that God would look on us and say, well, I'm gonna forgive you to the point and I'm gonna wash you so clean that you can be one of my children. And that is, it's an identity thing. It's this beautiful identity thing. I love what he says. And that is what we are. It is a for certain identity thing. If you put your faith in Christ, you 
are a child of God, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in your past, and no matter what you do even in your future. You are a child of God. And it's this, I mean, it's this incredible identity thing that you can rest in and you can say, God, thank you that I am your child. I'm not just some person on the side of the street that you took your time to listen to one time, but I am actually part of your family and you love me and you have given yourself for me so that I may grow, so that I may be who you've called me to be. This is a beautiful and amazing thing. And so he continues and he says, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The reason the world doesn't understand, doesn't know about us and what we believe is because they don't know Christ. They don't understand who he is. And that's all throughout, that's a, that's a pretty similar concept throughout all the scriptures. And he says it even again later in this section in, chapter, in verse 13. But then he says this really important thing. Dear children, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. It's this beautiful tension he creates about living in this world that we have been saved by Christ but that there is this fulfillment yet to come that would be the full realization of what that means to be a child of God. And what it means truly is to be made like him. So again, he's furthering this incredible idea that we would be called children of God. Not just that, but we would also be made like Christ. And that's actually the point of the whole Christian life is this progression into being made more like Christ. And the Bible talks, that talks in these kind of terms where it says you have been saved and you are being made like Christ you are, and then you are in this process where you're continually made like Christ throughout your life where you make mistakes, you repent of your sin and you say, God, I'm, forgive me of my sin. I have done wrong. I changed my heart so that I won't do that thing again. And then that eventually either when you die and go see Jesus face to face or when Jesus returns, and takes us into his eternal heaven that we would then forever be transformed. It's this term glorified, the glorification, that we are changed forever from who we used to be in our old sin and our old selves fully into this new body transformed by Christ so that we may stand before God. I don't know about you, but that makes heaven sound a lot better than simply saying we're gonna go to heaven someday. And it's this amazing idea, like no more brokenness, no more sorrow, no more, no more guilt, no more sin, no more suffering, no more tears, no more disease, none of that, gone. And we will be made like him. We will be in him, like fully resembling what the image of God was meant to be, fully restored, fully able to be in a relationship with him. And it's this amazing idea. And he says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. By believing in this, what happens is this washes us clean from all impurities, all unrighteousness, so that we may stand before God because God is pure. And by putting, our relationship, putting ourselves in a relationship with him, we become pure, totally spotless, clean, white before God. Isn't that just amazing to think about the fact that we look at, we know ourselves all too well, but God says, when I see you, I see my son. I have washed you clean. You are my child. And so this is our first characteristic that we, we must be in order to be the family of God, which is that we know that we are loved by the father and are called his children. That we would know this, again, as an identity thing, that this is a for certain thing that cannot be revoked, that cannot be taken away from us, that we are his children and we have been loved by him. And so what that does for us then is that opens up our hearts to love other people, to look at other people and say, look, look at this great love that I have. You need to have it too because it has done great wonders in my life. And so that we would see, that we would know that we are loved deeply by God. And this is all because of what Christ did for us. There's nothing that we could have done for ourselves. It's all because of Jesus' work by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and then raising from the dead to give us this new life. That is all because of him, not anything that we could have done ourselves. Let's continue, verse four. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. 
No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Now there's a lot to unpack in this, part, in this passage. And so we begin right verse four. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. It's this idea that sin is this, it's not just like what we do with sin is we often like think of it, oh, it's just this little mistake that we made, this little white lie or this one time where we let our anger get the best of us and oops, sorry God, no big deal. No, it is a big deal. What's, by calling sin lawlessness, what he's saying is this is actually this rebellion against God's law. It's living in a way saying, I'm gonna live my way. I'm gonna do what I want. I'm gonna ignore what God commands. And, it's, and so I'm gonna say to God, I don't want your law. I don't want you to tell me how to live my life. I'm gonna live my life how I want to live it. Every time we sin, that's essentially what we're saying. Even if we're the type of people who sin and are saying, and later say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I really, I don't wanna do that anymore. That's not how I wanna live my life. But all sin is this, whether you are a child of God or not, this is what sin is. It is lawlessness. It is walking away from God saying, I will do what I want to do. And so what the whole point of, of Jesus coming, he says, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. Jesus' purpose for coming was to take away the sin from our lives. And so as a result, as he says here, we shouldn't continue in sin. We shouldn't continue sinning. And it looks like what he's saying here is very black and white. Like basically, you should almost, like we could interpret this, people will have, and have, I've heard it, where they would say, you now have to be totally perfect once you give your life to Christ. But if you read chapter one, of 1 John, you know that's not true. We'll see that in a minute. But we could, th we could start to think that, oh my gosh, I have to be perfect now. But what he's really doing, again, it's these tests. He's basically saying, if someone makes a practice of sinning, makes a habit, makes it something that they excuse, something that they make light of, or even something where we could, even in our, our, our things that we are entertained by, where we are celebrating and glorifying sin in some way, shape, or form, that that is not the desire that God has for us. That's not what God wants for us to do. That truly, the concept here is about that our hearts would be set on God, that our hearts and our desires would be to say, I don't wanna do this thing anymore. I don't wanna sin. I don't wanna make a practice of it. And that there's this growth that is happening, this change that is happening where progressively more and more we become like Christ and stop sinning in our lives, stop sinning in our lives and, and progressively have sin beaten and defeated in our lives. That is the hope of the gospel. Again, it's not just to be forgiven, but it's also to be transformed. So to live in a way that eventually your sins die away, they are removed, okay? But he uses, again, he's using these really stark terms. You know, it, he says that anyone who continues to sin is of the devil, that, those are, that is a major escalated term right there. Like he's just, he's just taking it a whole new level. And what he's trying, again, he's trying to do is point us to this idea that sin is completely incompatible with having a relationship with Christ. You can't continue in sin if you want to be a follower of Christ. And oftentimes what we do is we create this like imaginary line Okay, where we say, okay, I'm gonna come up to that line and I'm gonna get as close as I possibly can to it without sinning and then I'm gonna, you know, step back. That, that, that's as far as I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go right here, but I won't, but I'm not gonna actually sin. That's not the concept that the Bible talks about because a lot of it is about what your attitude is. And I would actually call that attitude a sin because what you're saying is I'm still choosing my own way versus whatever God wants me to do. Instead of saying, God, you just tell me, you just tell me, I don't, that line there, Whatever it is you want me to do, I'm gonna live. I'm not even gonna worry about that line. I love this, this preacher I listen to sometimes and just sidebar, he's on at 8.30 in the morning on 93.9 KPDQ. His name's Alistair Begg. He's got a, an awesome Scottish accent. Probably takes up his preaching talent to a whole new level when you have a Scottish accent. Um, but this is what he says. I heard this a couple weeks ago when I was listening to his show. When it comes to sin, the issue is not how close can I get, but how far can I run? Because that's the terms that like Apostle Paul uses. He says, flee from immorality. Like, book it, run, get out of there. If you have sin in your life and there's a, a, a situation where you're tempted to sin, just run, get out. And that's kind of the point. That's, again, this is the, the depth of, of how far we need to get away from sin, that we don't want it to be any part of our lives that we would say, I'm out of here, I'm running. I'm getting out of this place so that I don't sin. 
But again, we might begin to look at this passage and really believe that somehow we are supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be now living in a manner that we are not supposed to sin anymore if we are really a true Christian. But here's the thing. That's not the case. I want to show you an, another quote. It's really, really cool. It's from this guy named I. Howard Marshall. And I've thought about it sometime, you know, starting my, my name with just my first letter, my first name. But I guess I'm, I haven't reached that level of smartness yet to do that. So this is what he, this is what he says. The person who is conscious of the new beginning that God has made in his life will seek to let that divine ideal become more and more of a reality. So it's about, again, that desire, that saying, I want to live in a way that reflects God and obeys God even if I mess up. Look at what he says. He knows that he cannot claim sinlessness for he has already read the first chapter of 1 John, but at the same time, he can claim God's power to enable him not to sin. And so again, this whole thing, it goes back to what our heart's desire is, and this is where we can be the part of the church and be the family of God. This is our characteristic number two, so we seek to obey the Father and take sin seriously. That we take sin absolutely seriously. We don't make light of it. We don't excuse it. That we say, this, this is sin in my life. I want it out. I want it gone. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I want to move on from it because here's the thing. Like the way, that, the way that the Bible describes Satan is that he's a roaring lion seeking to devour and destroy. Sin is actually like, so if you think of your sin as a, like, like a death trap. If you start to think of it that way when you're about, you're about to be tempted by it and you, you feel this moment and you, if you think of it, well, this is a death trap. This thing is gonna try and kill me, literally, like spiritually and kill me. I think that's gonna change the way we look and start to say, you know what, maybe I'm gonna stay away from this thing because it's gonna kill me. But we, we seek to obey God. We live in a way that reflects who God is. We obey his word, we obey his commands and that creates a whole different community and also a community in which that we would say to each other, we're gonna help each other out to move on from these sins, to say to each other and, it's, and only in close relationships. I would make that distinction so that everybody's not, you know, stepping in where they shouldn't be if they don't know, if you don't know each other. But where you're with people, you're in relationship with people where you could say to them, you know what? That area in your life, that really needs some work. I think that's why marriage is such a beautiful thing because no one can see you more in proximity than your spouse that could say to you, you know, you've got an issue with this in your life. I still love you, but that needs, that needs some work. And so we would, that's what part of being the family of God is that we build each other up, we encourage each other, and we say to each other, hey, that is gonna destroy you. That is not what God has designed you for. God has designed you for joy and for love and grace and mercy to be growing in your life, that you become more like Christ. So step away from that. Get away from that because it's going to destroy you. And so that's what we do. And so we cannot sit here and be neutral about sin. We have to take it very seriously seriously in our lives and seriously in the way that we uh, allow for things to come into our lives. Let's continue. Verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So he goes into this section, and what he did, he, in, in verse 10, he had this little transition. Notice that he connects doing right also with loving your brother and sister. So you look at that last phrase in verse 10. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So he connects not loving your brother and sister as one of those things that you could be, that's a sin in your life that you are continuing in, you are making excuses for, and then as a result, you are not walking in the light. You are not walking as a follower of Christ. And so this message they've heard from the beginning, from when they first became followers of Christ, this people he is writing to, he's saying we should love one another. It's our job. This is what we are supposed to do. And then he makes this a very interesting illustration where he starts talking about Cain. And, and this comes from Genesis chapter four, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible. Genesis chapter four tells us a story of these two brothers, of Adam. And this is right after the fall of man in Genesis chapter three, where sin enters into the picture of the story of the Bible. And Cain and Abel, 
both offer up sacrifices to God, Cain's is not accepted, but Abel's is. And part of the reason is because Abel's heart was in the right place before God and Cain's was not. Cain was jealous. Cain was angry. Cain was, uh, Cain was actually hating his own brother and had jealous of his sacrifice being accepted. But Cain also had like given only like a little bit of what he had and some of it, maybe not the best. And Abel had given his best. And what that says is he's giving like the most important of what he owns, the most important of himself, giving of like, his life for God, and Cain was not. Cain was making it convenient, Cain was doing what he wanted to do, and Abel was acting out in worship towards God. And so, by doing this, it says he belonged to the evil one and then murdered his brother. And the Bible is very clear, and John is even saying this too in this passage, that murder is, I mean, murder is also, it's a, it's a sin, it's wrong, but what's also a sin is the attitude and the heart thing that happened beforehand, that hatred inside of his heart that led him to the murder, that is also sin. Jesus does the same thing in Matthew chapter 5, where he says that, uh, you have heard it said that you shall not commit murder, but he says, but I tell you, if you hate a brother in your heart, you are guilty of the same thing. You are up for judgment for the exact same thing. Because what hatred basically does is it basically says to another person, I wish you didn't exist. I wish you weren't here. I wish I didn't have to deal with you because you make me so angry. And there are some times where we have situations that happen in our lives that are, you know what? Pain and hurt and something happens to us that, that is very painful. And so that's like, yeah, we get that. But Within the body of Christ, it is not a part of who we are supposed to be to be hating each other. Because really what that is, by us hating each other and hate, have, holding on to bitterness and, and withholding forgiveness from other people, what we are doing is we're actually acting like the rest of the world. We are actually acting like Cain rather than acting like Jesus and acting like who we are supposed to be as a church, as a family. And you know that in families, a family can't function if there is Uh, a lack of forgiveness and bitterness within different people, within its members. And so this is our characteristic number three that that we see is that we love each other and that we set aside our hatred and our bitterness towards one another. Because really what's going to happen is it's, we have to move on from these things because this reveals that we have truly been saved and that we are truly followers of Christ when we are able to move on from things that we from, from hating other people, from having bitterness towards other people. We need to forgive, we need to move on, and we need to not harbor these things because what he basically, what John basically says here is you can't have both. If you have hatred in your heart towards your brother or sister, look at this, he calls you a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Wow, he is putting it really bluntly here. You can't, so he's basically saying, you can't have both, you can't harbor hatred in your heart and also claim to be a dwelling of God in your own heart. One or the other is going to win out. And I've actually seen people who have claimed to be Christians allow for hatred to build up in their heart so much to the point that it was actually killing them, the killing them spiritually. They were dying. They were not being who they were called to be. And so, yes, here's the thing. You have to understand forgiveness and all that, those are hard. And they can be enabled by God's spirit so that we can do it because it's difficult work because there are going to be varying degrees. There are going to be some circumstances where it's like, well, this really wasn't that big of a deal, but somehow it really still hurt my feelings versus something that could be a really big deal. Somebody really hurts you, really upset you. No matter what it is, We cannot hold on to those hatreds. We cannot hold to those levels of bitterness because we are called as the church to live in a radical way of love that is completely different from the rest of the world, that the world lives in this idea of entitlement, that I I have my right to be upset with this person. I have my right to be angry and hate them. But instead, we are to be marked by a radical love. He says anyone who has passed from death to life, will love their brothers and sisters. This is how we know that we have passed, we have become a true follower of Christ if we love one another. And so we need to do that. Let's continue to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions 
and in truth. I love it when biblical writers get to this moment where they make it very clear. Because if you've been a student of the Bible long enough, sometimes you read it and you go, I don't even know what that means. But whether you have this moment where John goes, this is how we know what love is, makes it very clear. This is our definition of love, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Oftentimes, I think our culture has this really warped view of love, okay? I call it Cupid striking you stupid, okay? It's this uncontrollable emotion that like, you get hit with love, you get hit with this emotional feeling, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to love them. You know, I've, I've heard, even heard these phrases, the heart wants what the heart wants. No, it, no, no, that maybe, but also the heart is, as it says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful and wicked and desperately sick. So the heart wanting something is probably a bad sign, okay? But here's the thing is, it's this idea, and like we think that it's, we can't control ourselves. You can control who you fall in love with. And then and that's the sidebar. Here's a little sidebar here. If you're looking, you know, if you're single and you're looking for a romantic relationship, there's two aspects to this that you need to remember. One, this is the kind of person you need to be looking for. Someone who is willingly going to be giving of themselves for you, for the, your growth, for your betterment, that's actually going to say, I'm going to lay down my life for you because that's what I do as a follower of Christ because that's what Christ did for me. Secondly, that you seek to be that kind of person. That you would say, okay, I want to be in a relationship. I want to be a good uh, husband or wife to someone someday. So I'm going to start practicing by laying down my life for other people. That's a little sidebar, a little free bit of advice for you who are single. And I lived, I lived a while in singleness. So here's the thing, lots of experience. Take that time and it works. If you're patient and you say, I'm going to, this is what I want. I want to become this kind of person and then look for that kind of person. That's God provides, and he did for, for Lindsay and I, and it was an amazing story. But that's, again, that's a sidebar. But look at what he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It's like this duty, this job. It's part of our job description that we ought, that we are supposed to do this, to love one another, to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And he extends this by even saying, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? He extends this about laying, uh, laying down our lives to also laying down our possessions, to laying down the stuff that we have so that someone else can thrive and survive and grow. Because here's the thing. We live in a world where there are people in need. There could be people even in here that are pretending that they don't have need, but they legitimately do. Here's the thing. Our job as Christians is to say, we know that there are people around us that are in need and we're going to help them out because that is what Christ has called us to do. We are going to be givers. We're going, and it's radical. It's this radical generosity. It actually says in the book of Acts that the, the disciples early on, what they did is they shared with anyone who had need so that no one had need. It was this incredible thing that happened, a move by the Holy Spirit himself. It wasn't a move that they decided for themselves, like that they made up themselves. It's something that they decided, that they felt the Spirit of God calling them to do, and they did it. They shared with each other. And that is what we are called to do. We are called to look on people and not just have, like when, when he says, Pity, like we often think of pity as like, oh, I just, I see that they have, they have some issues. I just feel really bad for them. But then sometimes we just walk away and, and forget about it later. But to have true biblical compassion and pity means that we are actually going to do something about it. Because look at what he says. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So we would act upon these senses that we feel that we need to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is characteristic number four that our love towards each other's, our love towards each other resembles Christ's for us. That we would look as a family, look at each and every one of our brothers and sisters and say, I'm gonna love you like Christ. You may not be the most comfortable relationship for me. You may not be the person that I feel the most naturally, um, feel the most natural like relational chemistry, friendship chemistry with, but I am still going to love you like Christ because you are a member of Christ's body with me. We are in this together. You are my family. And as such, I have loyalty and I have buy-in that this is going to be, I'm going to take care of my people. 
I'm going to take care of them. And again, this is a radical love kind of concept that we have to ask God to say, God, would you change my heart so that I could be, I could live in this way, so I could act in this way? Because our natural bend is to be selfish. Our natural bend is to hold on to things for ourselves, to want to, to think of ways that, oh, well, to make up excuses. Oh, well, I don't need to necessarily take care of that person because I, I got this, this, and this, and this. No, it's this radical generosity that to the world looks foolish and looks ridiculous. But to God, it's pleasing his heart because we're saying, I am giving a little bit of myself so that I may lay down my life for this person so that they may know Christ. And I would even say this laying down of, of our lives also comes down to people's emotional needs as well. That you would be a comfort, a friend to people that need it. That you would support people in their time of need, emotional need, when there's grief and there are hard things happening in their life. To stand alongside people and to say, I'm your brother and I'm your sister in Christ. I'm going to stand with you and help you get through this time. So again, in order for us to think in a way that we are going to be able to be a church that would say, we're going to be the hope for the world. We're going to bring hope to this broken world. This is what we need to do. Is all of these things. To be a place where... It, and. We have to make this like a practice for us. We have to become experts at this. If we're gonna expect people to come in here from our community and from our world looking for something, looking for healing, looking for hope, that is what we need to be. This is what we need to do. And so in closing, let me just say this. The family of God is about a sense of belong, about a permanent belonging to God's chosen people who obey him and radically love one another so that all may grow to maturity in Christ. That is who we are, that is what we do as the family of God. Let's pray.